This week's message, given by Pastor Stephen Young at the Second Sunday United Methodist Church, March 13th, 2022. The message is the importance of community based on Acts 15, 36 to 41 and Luke 6, 12 to 16. The New Testament reading is Acts 15, verses 36 through 41. Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them. But Paul did not think it was wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and left, commended by the believers to the grace of the Lord. He went through Syria and Sicilia, strengthening the churches. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our gospel lesson is Luke 6, 12 through 16. One of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, whom he also designated apostles. Simon, who he named Peter, his brother Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, who was called the Zealot, Judas, son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. It's good to be with you this morning. Would you join me as I pray? Loving, gracious God, we give you thanks and praise for this beautiful day. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for walking with us in good times and tough times. Oh God, we trust that your word can transform our hearts and our lives. So we turn to you this time asking for your guidance, inspiration. As we listen to the words of scripture, Oh God, teach us your life-giving, life-transforming ways. Help us to walk closely with our Lord Jesus Christ during this season of land and beyond. Come, Holy Spirit, be with us. Open our hearts and minds. Help us to listen to your voices for our lives, for our community, and for our world. We pray all this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Sherry Turkle, a psychologist and professor at MIT, has spent years and years studying the technology of mobile connections, such as smartphones and tablet PCs. And she claims that these electronic devices are changing not only what we do in our everyday, everyday lives, but also who we are as a person. These electronic devices allow us to be with each other, but also at the same time somewhere else. There are so many uh, benefits from this technological advancement. She also warns that we can end up hiding from one another, even as we are constantly connected. She poses a critical question to this highly wired technological world, are we really and genuinely connected to each other? Are we really and genuinely connected to each other? Today's life challenges us with a wide range of stressors. You can name those. The list goes on and on. The economy is unstable. The world is experiencing violence and aggression among individuals and, and nations. Prices are going up. People, after this two years of pandemic, people going back to work and they work long, no longer hours and deal with the lack of job security constantly. 
Oftentimes, people feel stressed out and just hurt, and not so much because the work itself is hard, but they feel isolated, unsupported, and left alone. When you're going through a tough season in your life, it's such a blessing to have someone you can turn to, whether it's your family members or friends. And you are even more blessed if you have a community to turn to. We know it's not easy to overcome life hurdles and put up with pressures, but you will be encouraged and empowered to get them through when you are part of a caring, and and, and nurturing and life-giving community. As some Christian spiritual leaders like Henry Nowen indicate, the cries in the lives of many people, including Christians today, are closely connected with the deep feelings of not. Belonging, not being connected genuinely, not being connected deeply to one another. We know community matters. We know the importance of being part of a genuine, Christ-centered community. Many Christians understand the church as a community. You know, they think of the church in terms of community of gathered people, ecclesia. It's a great term for the church. Christians are the people who know the importance of, of community more than anyone else. Over the last two years, we heard the phrase, church is not a building but us. But the church is not just us, but us united in Christ. When you become a Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ, you, your relationship with, with God that is Vertical is inseparable from your relationship with others that is horizontal. Just like the cross of Jesus Christ symbolizes the interweaving of both dimensions. I received this small wooden cross from one of our church members. It might be hard of you to see this from where you are, but it's a, uh, from Redbird Missions. Let me show you this. Very cute. I, uh, I keep it in my office. <clears throat> you know, um, you can see the horizontal side is a, is a shape of a hammer. You can see, yeah. And the, um, the vertical side is a shape of a saw. So this is a creative creative uh, visualization of what the cross of Jesus represents and why Jesus came to this world. Literally, you know, those are the tools used by Jesus who was a carpenter by profession, right? Symbolically, these tools also represent what Jesus did through his ministry. Jesus came to heal our broken hearts and spirits and repair our broken relationships, and mend our broken world. That's why Jesus came to this world, to save us. The cross represents Jesus' ministry to repair our brokenness in all matters, in all areas, and to build a new identity, a new community, guided and governed by the Holy Spirit for the kingdom of God. To Christians, being a community, building a community is something fundamental, something essential to who we are and what we are called to be. However, building community, especially building a genuine community, is hard. It is hard. As someone says, the community is what everyone wants, but almost no one is able to sustain it well for long. Why? Because genuine community doesn't happen by accident. To build and sustain a such a community requires our intentional efforts, ongoing work and commitment. It doesn't happen by accident. Remember um, last Sunday we talked about the passion play uh, in Oramago in Germany. You know, as we continue to engage in this Lenten sermon series, 
based on the Passion play uh, in Oberammergau. This morning, I would like us to think about the role and the importance of community in our lives, in our faith journey. Again, the community is what everyone wants. And everyone knows that it matters. The question for us is, though, that if we truly believe in the importance of community, what are my role and my place uh, you know, to build a community that is genuine and Christ-centered? What would be my role and my place in it? When Jesus began to preach in his public ministry, his central message was that the kingdom of God has come near. He taught his disciples to pray, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. We say that every Sunday. What Jesus did in his ministry was to breach the gap between the kingdom in heaven and the kingdom on earth. The narrow the gap by creating a new community of God. Jesus dreamed of building a community that embodies the values and principles of God's kingdom. A community that leaves out God's love and justice, forgiveness and healing. However, the stories of Jesus' first disciples in the gospel show us that, you know, the community was not easy either. It was hard for them, for Jesus. Imagine when these two, uh, 12 disciples first met each other. You know, we know the challenges that often come up when a group of people who used to be separate come together to form one group. Of course, there were no such thing as teamwork training or orientation for these new disciples. Some of them were related as a family members and neighbors. Some of them uh, must have known each other for long already since the majority of them came from a, a, a town called Nazareth in Galilee, the region of Galilee. There were disciples who were fishermen who lived day by day, regardless of what's happening in the politics. There were a disciple named uh, Revi, who was tax collector, who supported Roman Empire through his work. One of the disciples belonged to the Zealot, the Jewish group that radically opposed and fought against the Roman Empire by the use of military force. The Gospel don't tell us much about their personal conversation, but we can imagine what kind of conversation they might have had at their dinner table, given their political differences. Some people, some disciples were jealous of others. They fought and, and split over the matter of who takes the uh, place of honor with Jesus. When Jesus, the Messiah, ruled the world. There were ordinary people with their own limits, brokenness, and differences. Though we tend to assume that the first band of Jesus' disciples were a homogeneous and harmonious group since they were called by Jesus to live and serve together. The gospel stories show that it wasn't the case at all. In a sense, the makeup of Jesus' disciples was a microcosm of the first century Jewish society. The disciples of Jesus were from all walks of life in terms of their political, religious backgrounds, their personality, their career, path. In his Bible commentary on Matthew, Tom Long, a professor at Emory, explains the calling of Jesus' disciples in terms of what Jesus did in this story. What Jesus did was to disrupt the family structures in, in the first century of Jewish society and to disrupt, to disturb the patterns of working and living in the first century. Jesus does so not by destroying them, but by renewing them. You know, when Peter and Andrew be, uh, be, uh, be, became part of a community built by Jesus, they didn't cease being brothers. They were still brothers, but there were brothers who do the will of God. James and John do not cease being sons. You know, they came from the same father, but they're not now not only the children of Zebedee, but also the children of God. Many of these disciples were fishermen by profession, and they leave their fishing nets, but they don't stop fishing. 
as we know, they're now fishers for the people in God's kingdom as, as Jesus called them to be. In other words, their identity has not been obliterated or removed, but renewed and transformed by the Jesus call to follow. And this is what has happened in the Passion Play performed by the community of Oremago in Germany as they have kept this tradition going for the last 400 years. You know, they perform the Passion Play every 10 years for the last four centuries. Last Sunday, we talked about the origin of the Passion Play and, and the vow they made before God. Since 2020, Passion Play was canceled due to the pandemic. I uh, read some articles on 2010 Passion Play. You know, rather than addition, tradition, their tradition dictates that the villagers register interest in the play. And there is a director who decides the main role, such as Jesus, Mary, and Jesus' disciples. And the names of the player are posted on a notice board outside the, the theater. It's a big day for the, for the community. You know, for 2010 Passion Play, the, the director presented two people who would perform Jesus. Select, they were selected from 1,800 applicants. One of them is uh, Frederick Mayotte, 29 years man, who is a spokesperson in township. And, and the second person was Andrea Richer, the 32 years old man who is a psychologist. You know, they, they were the who applied to take part in the play. They're not professional actors. You know, they would perform in the main role for the first time. And some of the residents uh, would uh, play different roles over the years. A man named Martin, you know, played Jesus in 1990 and 2000. And interestingly, he played Judas Iscariot in 2010. So both Jesus and Iscariot, uh, Judas Iscariot, what an interesting role he took, right? As people are selected for different roles, some people are happy and pleased, of course, while others are upset, unhappy, as we can imagine. You know, even though what they do is a great cause, they still had to face the tension, disagreement, and even conflict in the process of producing the Passion Play. And through the process that continued, had, had continued for the past 400 years, they have learned and, and are still learning that it mean, what it means to be a genuine community and what it means to agree, to disagree, what it means to forgive and let go of and move on and what it means to stay connected even in the midst of dis disagreements. As we read the story from the book of Acts this morning, even great spiritual uh, uh, leaders like Paul and Barnabas, they faced a sharp disagreement. You know, they, they uh, you know, ended up splitting and going on their separate ways. You know, Paul didn't want to take Mark for the upcoming mission trip because he thought Mark was a quitter and wasn't a good fit for his mission, mission work. And Paul and Barnabas couldn't reach at, a, at an agreement and ended up splitting. Again, community is hard. Community is hard. And, and sometimes the community is even harder among Christians. The stories of these early church leaders sound discouraging, but the Bible doesn't conceal the frailty of our humanity. What's encouraging is, though, that Paul later in his ministry addresses Mark again, you know, the Mark who, whom he, he excluded from his mission, mission work. He writes in his letter to uh, Timothy, saying, Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful in my ministry. You know, at one point he didn't want to get involved with him, right? He didn't want to take him to his mission trip, but now he is inviting him to be part of his missions. We don't know exactly what happened between these two Christian leaders. We can only guess. 
What happened? Something happened after the separation. You know, Paul and Mark, perhaps they let go of the past and were brought together for their shared mission and shared life. And it shows us what it means to be a genuine Christ-centered community. Friends, as a church, we live the story of Jesus through our words and deeds. Think about what is your place, what is your role in the community of SUMC. You know, some people say we're living in a culture where where people can simply cancel their relationship. They can delete the relationship by clicking on it just split second. Go to Facebook, disconnect, cancel, delete the relationships. What a sad reality. Even with family members, with longtime friends, because of the differences that we have, we see people canceling and deleting their relationships. But friends, as the author of the book Passion Play notes, the experience of genuine community is a sacred gift. And that's what Jesus is calling us to build here at Sakusana UMC. No matter what differences we are having, no matter how we are different politically, religiously, we are called to be a beloved, Christ-centered community. We are not just us, the group of people. We are us, united in Christ. Some 20,000 residents of the village take part in the, the Passion Play, the Omar Remigo in Germany. Now, only some people can participate as a main characters there, right? But others, you know, they participate as, as a musicians, like our choir. You know, they play a powerful role in the production and, and a full orchestra, choir bring it to life. Those who are not directly involved in the play, they're busy operating shops and restaurants and hotels, other business to, businesses to accommodate the visitors from all around the world. They have a role in the passion play, even though they're not performing in the play itself. Some of you are lifetime members of SUMC, and some of you are relatively new to this community of faith. But you've come from all walks of life. The thing is, at some point of your life, you all became part of this community. How well are different individuals individuals and groups in our church included in our single body? Think about that. What changes do we need to make to encourage more openness to embrace others who are different from us? How did Jesus' life and death bring peace for people from diverse backgrounds without canceling relationships? The 12 disciples called by Jesus gather around him in a community not simply to get to know one another, but to respond to a call to a promise of shared life and missions in God's kingdom. So friends, take time to listen deeply to your heart now. And think about your role in this community. What call do you hear? And what promise do you sense in being part of this wonderful community of faith? What would you like to see our community become as you continue to journey together in Christ? Morton Kelsey, who was an Episcopal priest and, and Jungian therapist, once said, Walking with others on their spiritual pilgrimage is an art. It's a form of art. This means that each, every one of us here is an artist that creates the beautiful portrayal of a living, growing, life-giving community, like a mosaic. Each of you is a mosaic of that artwork. And great artists have many, have, have many native skills, but importantly, their artwork is the result of the disciplined effort and willingness to keep trying You know, keep trying after failure, after failure. 
In a sense, what people in Oberammergau do is a symbolic of what's happening in our church, in local churches. We don't perform the grand scale passion play as they do. We don't have a huge open air theater as they do. However, wherever we are called to serve, in the name of Jesus Christ, those different places would become our open air theater, God's field. Of missions, mission field, and we are the performers. Each of you is a performer, and God is a director. So, friends, what is your role there? What difference can you make through your performance, through your presence, through your witness? As I close my message, I、um, I want to share a, a, a testimony from one of our church family, Sandy Ergo, and、uh, for the last two years, she stayed、uh, online worship. And she shares、uh, what this community of faith has meant to her. Let us watch. Hi, I'm Sandy Ergo, and a member of this church for about 32 years. As a young child, I was full of energy and not much for sitting still. As a coping mechanism, when forced to sit and listen, I developed a habit of drawing and doodling. Somehow, it helped me channel my excess energy. And concentrate on what was being said. I continued that habit as an adult, and some of you who collect the offerings at this church may be familiar with the pencil drawings that used to appear on almost all of my envelopes. For the past two years, due to COVID-19 pandemic, I have been forced, like many, to mostly attend church from home. One upside was it allowed me to move my doodling. Off of the offertory envelopes and onto much larger pieces of paper. The pandemic has been long, and I now have a collection of drawings. They were just pencil drawings until Pastor Stevens suggested that I color them and share them. These are minor doodles and sketches, and not held out as works of art. They likely are not meaningful to anyone who does not attend SUMC. To me, they now represent an opportunity to show my appreciation and admiration for Sakasana United Methodist Church and the people who make it so special, and to demonstrate how important this church is and how well it has done in such difficult times. So this is a little visual walk through the last two years of the life of our church. I hope it stirs in you what it stirs in me: feelings of hope and gratitude and memories. Of how bright a light SUMC shone into the dark days of COVID. To be sure, all of us were negatively impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Our experiences ranged from disruption of previously basic elements of our lives to the sudden loss of loved ones. For some, the impact was particularly acute. With two catastrophically ill family members in my house. From the very beginning, we viewed the pandemic as an overwhelming and immediate threat. We took drastic measures. Suffice to say, we were quite limited and isolated. And as months wore on, being able to see all of you every Sunday morning from my kitchen table literally meant the world to us. We were able to hear Pastor's sermon and Angie's beautiful and familiar voice, to sing along with the choir's lovely hymns. And hear Audrey and the praise band play, and to see the familiar faces of those of you who read the scripture, we even saw Bishop Shaw. I am so very grateful for Pastor Stephen and the worship committee, and especially the members of the digital ministry team who made sure that the service was available online every week. This church did everything right. First and foremost, you protected the physical, mental, and spiritual health. Of every member of this congregation to the best of your ability. At SUMC, one only needs to pay attention to see that the words of Jesus are not just taught; there is a concerted effort to live by them. It is heartening. There have been so many lessons, hope offered, wisdom shared, and unfortunately, also heartbreak. So many have been lost. You may not have heard from me as I lived in my kitchen and hid my fragile family from the deadly virus, but please know that those who were not there still mourned along with you. 
as you will see in these pages. It was most certainly a sad time in the history of the world, with nearly a million dead in our country alone. But the messages that leap from these pages are messages of faith, hope, and love in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Please know that every single person who played a role in keeping SUMC's light shining bright during this dark time was appreciated beyond measure. You kept us going when the going was quite tough. Thank you so very much. As you can watch from this video, the, the, drawings, is, uh, the drawings are sort of a, um, her visual meditation and reflection on our worship, uh, life of the church for the last two years throughout this pandemic. And we're grateful to Sandy for sharing her artwork and testimony that recapitulates our journey as a worshiping community for the last two years. You know, it helps us to see the importance of community and our place in it. Each of you has been there to support and to sustain this community, for which I am very grateful and thank you. We give glory to God who has guided us faithfully and called us to worship and do ministry together through these challenging times. Amen. <laughs>